Just this week, I took both my kids and one of my nephews out to eat, and, um, <laughs> and <laughs> we were at this particular restaurant trying to love local, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we were the only people... <laughs> I'm already laughing at my own story. Uh, and while we were there, we were the only uh, 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 people in the restaurant. And uh, this other guy walked in, and he said that he wanted to fill out a job application. And so he sat at the table right behind us, and he was filling out a job application. And while he was filling out, filling out the application to work there, uh, the assistant manager comes around the corner and says, and says, Man, I hope you're a hard worker because I'm quitting this dump tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm just like, huh, huh, don't know if that's the best rallying cry for wanting the position. And he goes, he goes, oh, really? Uh, uh, why is that? And the, and, the, and the employee who apparently has quit by today spent the next 20 minutes explaining to him and me and the little ones why he hates this restaurant. And, uh, but then... But then to end on a high note, he said, well, hey, lucky for you, I'm quitting, so maybe that opens up a job for you. I thought, that's the worst sales pitch on the face of the planet. Luckily for you, I'm leaving this dump to give you a shot at it. But it made me think about Jesus. Jesus said in the Gospels, hey, lucky for you, I'm leaving. I'm leaving this place. I tell you the truth. So he's like, this is not even a joke. <laughs> it is better for you that I go away if I do not go the helper. We talked about that word of this last uh, Sunday, this past Sunday. The word also means counselor or in Greek, paraclete. Uh, it's the idea of a legal term in which a, a defender, a legal representative, a legal uh, representative on your behalf stands with you, walks with you, counsels you, helps you through the matter. Well, if I don't go, if I don't leave this place, Jesus is saying to all of us filling out an application, if I don't leave this place, um, if I don't go, um, then I can't send the helper to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says it's better for you if I go away. Jesus, you're going to have to explain that. Because in my perspective, it's better for me if you stay with me. Think about it. Let's just look at your own track record. Let's rewind the DVR for a second. Jesus, if we're hungry, you can make us a meal out of a little boy's lunch. Jesus, if we're low on cash, you have a track record of pulling coins out of a fish's mouth. Hey, if we're sick, you can heal us, right? If we're in trouble, you can defend us. If we're up against Rome itself, you can walk through doors on our behalf. Jesus, it's better for me if you stay with me. And he says, no, because if, if I'm here in the flesh, I can only be in one place at one time. Though I'm God and though my jurisdiction and my territory is universal, I still humbled myself in the form of being God from heaven to earth when I took on the very nature of mankind. So when I left heaven, I left my I left my, my, um, my, my, my spirit, if you will, there, and I wrapped myself up in human form, limiting myself to be in one place at one particular time. But if I go back to the Father and sit at his right hand and intercede for you, those I love, I will send to all y'all, how we would say in West Virginia, you-ins. I will send you-ins, all y'all, the helper, the paraclete on my behalf. Ooh. So apparently, right out of the gate, Jesus wants us to know this is not a good uh, third in the Holy Trinity, and it's not a good, um, uh, it's not a good uh, consolation prize for his absence. No, no, no. Jesus wants us to know it's to our benefit that he goes to the right hand of the Father, intercedes, that means pray for us, and in the meantime, he's going to send us something that will be of great value and benefit to our life. For time's sake, let me just build a foundation before I get practical. We are jumping in on, on the middle of a conversation, and so, and so this is old school. How many old school people we have that were born in the 1900s? You know what I'm talking about? Come on, just old school. Back when you had a house phone and you were trying to talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend and then your parent would get on the phone and be like, Derek, it's time to get off the phone. And you're like, Dad, 
you're ruining my street cred. This is what's going on. There's a conversation taking place, and we picked up the phone mid-read, and this is what is going on. Then he opened, Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scripture, and this is what I've been praying all week for you. Is that tonight, God will open your mind, and now you, you would able, uh, be able to grasp something that you were once afraid of or you once rejected because of a church tradition, not a biblical God-ordained perspective, and what you've been avoiding, now you will embrace. Then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures, and he told them, well, this is what was written. If you've been reading your Bible, you've already read this. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, uh, in repentance for the forgiveness of sins... Um, everything we just, uh, just talked about when we uh, took uh, Holy Communion. He'll be preaching my name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You will be my witness. You are witnesses of these things. How many of you can testify that you are a witness to the forgiveness and the grace of God on your life? Now watch this. So I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay until... Let's not be a people who's always in a hurry. Name it, claim it, grab it, blab it, move on from it, forget about it. Until we need something again, and then we'll name it and claim it. No, no. Let's be people who are disciplined enough to slow down when we need to slow down so we can actually seek and not just look. There's a difference between looking and seeking. Looking is (laughs) looking is what your kids do when they can't find the milk in the refrigerator because they didn't want to move one item, or me. <laughs> okay, I'll be honest, I'll be honest. We're out of milk. Look behind the box. Oh, there it is. But stay until. Stay is a command. Until is a timeline. You see that? Stay and wait for it. Pay attention. Seek. Don't just look. Something's going to happen. Command timeline. Well, what are we waiting on? For you to be clothed with power. Somebody say power. Power Power from on high. Jesus says, it's to your benefit if I leave and I send the Holy Spirit. Then later on he says, stay until you've been clothed with power. So now watch this. He's talking to believers who have already accepted Jesus as Lord of their life, okay? So apparently, what Jesus is talking about in these two instances is an experience other than your salvation experience, okay? I'm bringing that up because there's some church uh, um, doctrine that would teach that once you are saved, you immediately receive all there is to receive in regards to the Holy Spirit, Well, at the moment of salvation, when you give your life to Jesus, when you cross the line of faith, the Bible says the Holy Spirit lives in you. That is true. But there's more for you to experience. If there wasn't, then what are they staying and waiting for? What are they waiting for um, uh, power for? Now, we can take it too far where we seek what we're about to talk about, the gift of the Holy Spirit, more than the Holy Spirit himself. For example, let's say I'm at uh, the Potomac River, and, uh, and I start to drown. And somebody comes out, they risk their life, they come out, and they grab me, and they, and they, and they took me back um, to the shore. And they said, hey, I'm going to go back out and seek and find other people who want to be rescued. You stay here, and in the meantime... Here's a box filled with gifts. There's water in there. There's a pamphlet on how to swim. Uh, there's, there's, there's an emergency phone. There's a change of clothes. There's, 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 there. So I, I will be back. You stay on the lookout for me. I'm going to go seek and find people who want to be rescued. But in the meantime, here's the gift that will benefit your life until you wait my return. Now, the gift did not save me. He saved me. The gift was an added benefit until he returns. The lifeguard was Jesus 
The gifts of the Holy Spirit did not save me. They are an added benefit to my salvation experience. You follow me on this? So Jesus wants us to know right out of the gate that there is another experience for you to experience other than your salvation experience. We say it around here all the time that your faith journey is a journey. So there's more to your faith journey than just accepting Christ into your life. God wants you to know there is another experience to enjoy. So now watch this. Acts chapter 19. Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Notice, they are believers. Uh, And what's the first thing Paul wants to know upon meeting them? He doesn't ask them about their church background. He doesn't ask them about what classes or what conferences they've been to. He didn't ask them their, their spiritual practices on transubstantiation or superlapsarianism or any of those other doctrines. He just says, did you have the other experience yet? Because you need this box. You need this box and you need this pamphlet. You need to know how to swim through life. There are some challenges. There are some storms. Okay, I can't keep the water from rising, but I can keep the water from rising over you if you know how to swim. Have you received this other experience? I'm so glad you've been saved, but now you need something to help you live that saved life. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they answered, and we talked about this this past Sunday. Uh, We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so to fast forward, Paul places his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. Notice he's talking to believers, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. It is to that end we'll spend our time tonight. And they spoke in tongues. Now, depending on your church background right now, you're like, holy cow, why did I come tonight? (laughs) This is it. I invited my friend for months. They finally came, and this is what we're going with. This is what we're doing. Wouldn't it be just like God to have you here tonight for a message that you didn't even think you needed, but you will leave clothed with power from on high? Perhaps God knows what he was doing all along. (laughs) You can tell him I said that. (laughs) Matter of fact, I would appreciate it if you would. And uh, let's talk about this gift that God has to give. Some people call it speaking in tongues. Some people call it a prayer language. What is it all all about? Uh, who, Who is it for? So Sunday we talked about the Holy Spirit who, and it was an introduction into the Holy Spirit. Tonight I'm going to talk about Holy Spirit what? What is this all about? And then this Sunday, we'll talk about Holy Spirit, why, okay? Let's talk about, there are three types of speaking in tongues according to Scripture. Um, Pay no attention to this. Uh, the, The first one is the foreign language. The Bible says that when some people speak in tongues, they're speaking in an actual, literal language that they did not learn, but it is a real language in some parts of the world. Okay, for example, my dad and mom are missionaries to Guatemala. They were telling me a while back that they were at this particular city in which the people, uh, they primarily spoke uh, Spanish, but a lot of them spoke in a different tongue, a different language. Well, in this particular moment after a service, there was people down at the altar and they weren't looking for God, but they were seeking God. Well, something in my dad's spirit said, well, why don't you just speak in tongues over them while you're praying for them? Now, he's, he's not going to make a big show out of it. He wasn't like waving a banner or shaking a tambourine or making a big scene, but he just got down and in his, um, in his, in his prayer language, speaking in tongues, Uh, He just quietly inside uh, the man and the woman's ear, or um, next to their ear, um, he just spoke in this prayer language. They begin to immediately weep and sob in the presence of God. Now, he doesn't know what he's saying. And they're like, you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand. You just told me my entire life story, all the big events, and, 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 and how God was with me through all those events in my original dialect. 
Now, he did not take Rosetta Stone to figure out how to share that, let alone how he could know that. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will work through physical, literal languages that you do not know, but it is to the benefit of those who hear it. But that's not all the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues does. The Bible also says that it's for a language of angels. Now, this is where some people get tripped up, and I'm always tripped up that they're tripped up. I can't understand why they can't understand how many of you know that there are plenty of languages around the world. There's Spanish, there's German, there's Italian, there's Swahili, there's Alabama, there's Arkansas. There's plenty of languages around the world. So if different countries can speak in different languages... It's not hard for me to believe that heaven has a language as well. If I go to Africa and they're speaking French, I can go to heaven and expect them to be speaking heaven, right? Like we do know that we're not all going to go to heaven and speak English, right? Like we do get that. Well, if different countries have different languages, well, then perhaps heaven does too. That's not hard to believe, is it? No, pastor, it's not. You're welcome. There's a foreign language, there's a language of angels, and then there's a language of the Spirit. Ooh. God is infinite. People are finite. God is full of strength. He is eternal. He is self-sustaining. He doesn't need food and water to live and survive. We do. We are very limited creatures. We need a lot to make this happen on a daily basis. Now watch this. There is a part of you that is not limited by anything. There is a part of you that is infinite. There is a part of you that was created in the image and in the likeness of your creator himself, God. You are not physical beings that carries a spirit. You are a spirit clothed with a physical body. There is a part of you that is not limited, and that part is free to communicate to the freedom, the depth of you. Your spirit calls out and cries out to the deep parts of God. There's a part of you that's not limited by your English language. There's a part of you that is not limited by your vocabulary. There's a part of you that is not limited by your past education or your prior church experience. There's a part of you that can communicate to the deep parts of God that surpasses your mind, your intellect, your understanding, and your homeschool education. There's a part of you that communicates to the deep part of God. What is that? It's not this. It's this. It's the language of your spirit. Christians love the verse that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all you ever ask for, hope for, imagine. We just don't want to believe it. We love the, we love the, we love the passage uh, that says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But we forget the next verse. God reveals it to us by his spirit. So watch this. We love to say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can even understand all the things that God has in store for his people. But if we can't understand it with our eye gate or ear gate or a mind gate, we reject it. So do we believe it or not? Do we want it or not? Or are we just claiming stuff that we don't believe? Because it feels good. The best is yet to come. But is it? Or do I have to understand it for it to be good enough for me to achieve it? We can't say God has something in store for us that no mind has conceived and then limit what God wants to do through the conception of our limited mindset. Romans 8.16 says our spirit testifies with God's spirit. There's a part of you that God wants to commune with, communicate with, have a conversation with, have a relationship with that would bypass your limited intellect, right? There is a bond between a parent and a child that supersedes a degree, like an educational degree, right? Because a bond is not limited through classroom experience. It's through the family vibe. There is a part of you that God wants to communicate with. It's your spirit man. It's your spirit woman. 
The Spirit himself, it's capitalized, it's divine, the Holy Spirit, wants to testify. What is that? Speak to, educate, experience with, have a relationship with, showcase, show off, reveal, resurrect, renew, redeem, restore. The Spirit himself wants to do that. How's he going to do it? Not with our own mind, because it's too limited, but with our spirit that is infinite. So watch this. So if it's believable and it's possible that this language of heaven and the language of the spirit exist, what then does speaking in tongues actually do? Like, okay, I believe it. It's not hard for me to believe it anymore, but what's the point of having it? Number one, write this down. It gives us direct and a more intimate access to God. We have all at times in our life been in a place where we didn't know what to pray or how to pray. Have you ever been there? Your soul is grieving. The request, the demand, the urgency is hot and high. Now is the time. This is my moment. Lord, this is out of my control. This situation is out of my, my hands. I don't know what to do anymore. And you almost get frustrated because you don't have the, the intellect or the words to know what to pray or how to pray. But our spirit does. Because again, we are praying through our intellect and our vocabulary, but our spirit needs no such roadmap. In those times, praying in our spirit is a communication between our spirit and God's spirit. Do you know the Bible says that God can interpret a groan that we can't utter? That there's a part of you that's so overwhelmed, all you can say is, oh. And God says, I know exactly what you mean. What is that? That's his spirit communicating and communing with your spirit. Uh, it's spirit talk. 1 Corinthians 14. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. So number one, if you're going to receive this gift that the lifeguard has to give, you're going to have to stop worrying so much about what other people are thinking because this language isn't for them, it's for God. Sooner or later, you're just going to have to be like, you know what? I wasn't talking to you anyways. Mind your own business. <laughs> and <laughs> number, number, number two, speaking in tongues, the Bible says, gives us boldness. Boldness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Notice here again. This is a different experience than the Holy Spirit living in you at the moment of salvation. This is an additional experience. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Now, the context of the text is just as important as the text itself. This command, this promise was given not in the height of elation and celebration of the empty tomb, but when all hell broke loose and persecution was abounding everywhere. People were literally dying, being filleted alive. Uh, the emperor Nero was cutting off the heads of, of Christian believers and using their skull as torches for his garden. It was not the best of time. It was the worst of time. And the Holy Spirit says in a season like that, in a moment like that, in a hostile society like that, when, when you are the epitome of a cancel culture and people are out to silence you and belittle you because of your faith in Christianity, because of your values because of your principles oh there's something that will rise up on the inside of you it will come on you and it will give you power to stand firm stand strong stand proud that I am not here on my own accord and nor will I deny I've been saved by the lifeguard and he's given me a gift for my survival boldness the words you will be filled in Greek is the idea of a ship captain ordering that the ship's sail be open to its full capacity and now the ship will be driven along by the wind. Here's the idea. 
it becomes less about what you're afraid of and more about what you're filled with. When the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you and you begin to speak in the language of the angels and of heaven and your spirit begins to have a private conversation with the Spirit of God, it becomes less about the people you're afraid of and trying to appease, a please, appease and please. Uh, and it comes more about what you have been filled with, the overwhelming breath of God himself. Boldness. What moved the disciples to go from men hiding behind a locked door, scared for their life in John chapter 20, to now in Acts chapter 2 and 3, declaring passionately in the open airs under, 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 under the threat of persecution and death, the only difference between them hiding behind locked doors and now publicly proclaiming with confidence the risen Savior was that they were clothed with power. What's going to make the biggest difference in your life? To keep standing for Jesus in a world that is growing increasingly and rapidly anti the values of Jesus? You're going to need a box filled with gifts to help you stand firm. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and your spirit connecting with his. Number three. Speaking in tongues, what does the Bible say it does? Well, apparently it gives us power to do the supernatural. Acts 2, Acts 5, Acts 6, Acts 8. We sense what God is doing and then we move in boldness and we operate with power and with faith. Let me just keep going. Speaking in tongues, it gives us supernatural discernment. And that makes sense because if our spirit is talking to his spirit, of course, his spirit is going to talk back to our spirit. And now we have a discernment factor that we didn't have before because now we're having a conversation we never had before at a depth and at a level that never took place before. What happened? It's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the PVC pipe of heaven to your soul. Hey, don't go there. Don't do that. Right? Supernatural discernment. 1 Corinthians 14. You know what else the Holy Spirit does? The band can come back, but let me go here. The band gives us strength. The Holy Spirit gives us strength. Did I just say the band gives us strength? <laughs> did I say that? I think I did. I think I did. I mean, they do too, but, but because they can't always follow you around, <laughs> they're not in the box the Savior's giving you. <laughs> that would be cool, especially you just pop out. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit gives us strength. 1 Corinthians 14. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Jude chapter 1. But you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most high faith and pray in the Spirit. <clears throat> in Ephesians 1, one of the ways... Paul gives, he's given a list on how we can survive spiritually dark seasons and times. One of his survival kits, if you will, is, 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 is praying in the Holy Spirit. In that sense, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is less about doctrine and dogma than it is about survival. What's this? Isn't it crazy? How because our mind can't understand something, we reject it immediately. There is so much that I don't know and I don't understand, but I take full advantage of. I cannot tell you how IT works, but your boy's connected. I don't understand how cities can come in and redesign the infrastructure and da da da, but I be driving. If we limit our activity to the things we can only describe and define, we got to throw a whole bunch of things out of our life. And besides that, let's, let's just demystify speaking in an unknown language. We do it all the time, don't we? I'm at a restaurant. Hey, you hungry? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you going to get? Mm. Uh, the waitress tells me the special. Mm. I eat the food. Mm-mm. I get up to go pay for the meal and I hit my knee. Mm. Then Jessica gets up. Mm-hmm. What's this? 
I just said M's. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm, mm. I just said M's five different ways. None of what I just said is an actual word. Yet I was communicating five different ways. Uh, oh, 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 huh, eh, huh. We communicate all the time with things that don't actually make any sense. Why are we so afraid to believe that heaven has a language and God is the great instructor who wants to teach our spirit how to hmm, how to hmm. Because just maybe when you get comfortable interceding with your spirit and not your mind, then you'll be more comfortable trusting God that God wants to speak back into your spirit that would bypass your mind. What do we do then? Luke chapter 11, I just want to encourage you and then we're going to get out of our way and pray. Jesus saying this, so you know it's important, which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Of course you want to do that. And if you being evil will give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So let me answer the question. Who's the Holy Spirit for? Everybody. Who has been given the invitation to learn the language of the heavens? Everybody. Who does God want to communicate at a deep personal level with? Everybody. You see the pattern? And so what do we do? By faith, we're going to do three things tonight. Some of you, you're going to need to wrestle this through and you're going to go home and you're going to pray about it and you're going to think about it and you're going to apply these three things or maybe it's going to be next week. Sooner or later, you're going to come to the place where you're going to say, I'm just going to go after it. If it's on the menu, I'm ordering it. If God's offering it, I want it. If he's good for my salvation, then he's good for communication. And if he's good for communication, then he's good with bypassing my intellect to get down in my spirit. And by the way, Christianity is not, is not a mindless activity where we just walk blindly into this thing. No, there's evidence that demands a verdict. And when you look at the evidence, the verdict is he is guilty. He is the unique matchless son of the living God. He died for the sins um, of humanity. Three days later, he rose again. He was ascended into heaven um, by, by a large multitude account of eyewitnesses. And one day he's coming back. And if he fulfilled over 200 other promises, then we can take to, take to the bank. He's going to fulfill the, this other one that he's coming back to take us off the island and to take us back to where he is. Here's what we're going to do tonight. By faith... I want you to remove the barriers. So if there's sin in your life, go ahead and confess those, give those over to God. But let's not limit, to, limit the barriers to just sinful activities or obstacles. I'm talking about mental barriers. The fact where you have to remain in control of every aspect of your life. You just need to trust God and get off the island. By faith, you're gonna remove the barriers. Number two, by faith, you're going to request to be filled. What is that saying? That means that you are specifically asking to be filled with something that doesn't make sense totally in the natural. So what is that all about? In that regard, it's about humility. God, I trust you. And I want all that you have for me. And so I surrender myself to you. Would you give me the box? I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. As deep calls to deep. And wind would call to wind. God, the deep parts of me is calling to the deep parts of you. See the humility, the strength, and the trust in all of that? By faith, we remove the barriers. We request to be filled. And then number three, by faith... We receive the gift. We receive the gift. In other words, you're going to stop go, um, you're God's not going to come on you like uncontrollable hiccups 
where you're just like walking throughout the day and you're like, <laughs> oh, I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, no, it's not gonna happen to you accidentally, right? It's gonna be in a moment of intentionality where you're surrendering and you're trusting God. And watch this, God's also not gonna come down to you and start wiggling your lips. <laughs> He's not doing that. There's gonna have to come a moment in your prayer time by faith you switch from operating in your cognitive mind to operating in the mind of your spirit. There has to be a moment where you trust God enough to say, God, I'm worshiping you. I'm edifying you, I'm praising you, I'm magnifying you. God, I'm using the language that you have given me to adore you, to worship you, to uplift you. Lord, to praise you, to worship you. And now I'm gonna be quiet and I'm gonna listen to my spirit. I'm not searching for words. I'm not searching for the right phrases or the right axioms or the metaphors. No, I'm listening to, in the best of my ability, my spirit person. And now I feel like God has given me something to say and it doesn't make sense. But in faith, I'm going to say what I feel. In faith, I'm going to speak what I sense. Now, let me play devil's advocate and tell you how the devil rolls. You're going to go for it and you're going to verbally utter something that doesn't make sense to you in the mind. And the devil's going to say, that's gibberish. That's childish. Here's what he's going to say. You sound stupid. I hope you know that. You sound stupid. Shut him down. Tell him how stupid he sounds when he's been defeated and he's still ro ro roaring around, roaming around like a roaring lion. He ain't got no teeth. He's got no claws. He's got no bite. But here he is trying to be a big man on campus. Hey, my language itself can push back 10,000 demons. So let me sound stupid to you, hell. If you sound overly good in the bowels of hell, something may be wrong. He's gonna say, you sound stupid. You sound like a child. You sound gibberish. He said, I ain't trying to talk to you, devil. I'm just practicing listening to my spirit man. I'm just practicing uttering the sound of the angels. When my wife and I moved to Ecuador to be missionaries for a little while, I felt stupid and I sounded stupid trying to repeat a language that wasn't natural to me. Give it enough time, you'll begin to speak. And so what are we doing? We're practicing humility. We're practicing turning off the flesh and turning on our spirit. We're practicing speaking out what our spirit is saying. And then the Bible says, and suddenly they were filled. I'm praying that you want this until your suddenly arrives. Don't discount the reality because it didn't happen immediately. And don't give up so easily. Stand up with me across this place. <clears throat> I don't think you need to plan on an hour altar call for you to receive all that God has for you. I think God matches your level of intentionality and intensity. You seek, you'll find. You knock, that door will be open for anyone who asks receives and anyone who seeks finds. Raise your hand towards heaven, Spirit of God, we worship you with the language we do have. Lord, we worship you and we magnify you with the language we are aware of. You are great. You are greatly to be praised. Lord, there is no one like you, no one beside you. You are good. You are pure. You are holy. You are righteous. You are a good judge. You are a good friend. You are a faithful father. You are a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father. You are a prince of peace. You are our ever-present help in time of trouble. Whoa, God, we call you Emmanuel, God with us, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It's you. You are the great lifeguard. You are the great physician. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. You are Jehovah Nisi. You are Jehovah Shalom. You are our peace, our joy, our refuge. God, we acknowledge you with the language we do have. And now, God, we silence our voice 
to silence our mind. We're not looking for words. We're looking to sense this, our spirit person connect with the spirit of God.